About two years ago, I made this solid cast iron riser for the multi-fix tool post on my lathe. And since that time, I've received several inquiries about whether I'm gonna make these castings available for sale. The answer I've always given is maybe, but today I'm changing that answer to yes. To make that happen, we need to make a new casting pattern with my logo on it. We're gonna try out some new materials for making casting patterns, and I'll show you the problem I've been having in Fusion 360 that's the real reason why this has taken two years. When I did this project two years ago, I did it in collaboration with Clark over at Windy Hill Foundry. I made the casting pattern, sent it to Clark, he cast the blanks, sent them back to me, and then I machined it and installed it on the lathe. And I have not looked back. This has been an amazing improvement for this little 10 by 22 lathe. And I think I've taken it off once since then to use the compound because I needed to cut a taper, but I have been just loving it. I have gotten quite a few requests over the years to make these castings available, and I hadn't done it initially just because of the logistics. These things are heavy. It turns out there's a lot of cast iron in here and they're expensive to ship. So if I have Clark cast a bunch of these and then ship them to me and then I keep them in inventory and have to ship them again, it really drives up the cost. And it, it's just something I did not want to mess around with. Now, I've been talking with Clark about it recently and I think we've worked out a situation where he can cast these on demand and ship them directly to the end users and that is a much more practical arrangement. So to do that, I do want to take the Windy Hill Foundry off of the casting and put on my own logo. And I thought that was going to be the easy part of this process. And honestly, I've been playing with this off and on for the last two years because I knew I kind of wanted to go in this direction. But putting my logo on this curved surface turned out to be way more complicated than I thought. Let's go into the computer and I'll show you what was wrong and show you how I fixed it. This is the model that I want to put the text on. I want to just put my logo right here on the face. And doing this in Fusion 360 on a compound curved surface like this is a little bit harder than it might seem. I had originally had a sketch here with the Windy Hill Foundry text, and that's what I had on here. But now I've got a sketch in here with my logo. If I hide this, you can see that a little bit better. And what I've done is I've projected up the lines from the screw holes just so that I can have my text centered and it'll look visually centered between those holes. And that's important because this is not symmetric, so just dropping it right in the center doesn't necessarily work. There are various approaches for getting this text onto the surface, but just trying to emboss this down onto the curved surface doesn't work very well. It kind of distorts things. And so if you look around on the internet, you'll find a whole bunch of tutorials showing you how to put text onto a curved surface and it always involves creating some kind of simpler control geometry. So in this case, I just created a sketch that approximates this surface. I actually did some intersections on here with a curve and found the point where I wanted the text so I could get it at the right angle and then revolved that and created a cone. And so this cone approximates the surface that I wanna put the text on, at least right in the area where I want the text and it's a simple geometry that Fusion 360 can handle well. So then I can just take my text and use the emboss tool, create emboss, select my sketch profiles and select the surface that I want to emboss it onto and create that text. And so now we have that text on the cone and then to map that onto the curved surface of the tool post riser, we just use the split face feature. So that's here under modify split face. And I've already done that. And we just select the face to split is the surface of the tool post and the splitting tool is just the top surface of all of this extruded text. And all we're really using the extruded text on the cone for is just to do geometry mapping between the flat plane of the sketch and the curved surface of the tool post. And so with that on there, we can then turn off our cone, and now we have a surface that we can do a face offset. So all I have to do is select all these faces and go up here to modify offset face and just pull that text up. And I pulled it up 30 thousandths of an inch, and now we have our text. But this is not good enough. We need 
draft on this. If I flip this over upside down, so you can see the way this is gonna go into the sand mold, it's gonna go in this direction and then it's gonna to have to be pulled straight up. And in this orientation, if this is pulled straight up, you can see there are overhangs here that the sand is gonna get caught behind and it's gonna break away from the mold. So what we need to do is chamfer this. And I wanna put 45 degree chamfers all the way around. And I intentionally place this text very low down here on this curve, because if I put it up high, then no amount of chamfer is gonna get me uh, the draft that we need to extract it from the mold. So the obvious thing to do is to just chamfer this. Select the top of the letter, modify, chamfer. I know I pulled it up 30,000, so 0.030, and it will not chamfer it. It says it could not be created at the requested size. And that's because there's some geometry problems going on, and this is what I've been fighting for the last two years off and on. Every time I think about the project, I load it up and try some things, and this is the problem I'm having. Now, we can do a smaller chamfer, so 0 0.015 will work, 0 0.02 will not. So 0 0.015, about half, is about the most I could do. Well, that's easy, so we'll just chamfer around the bottom, also 0 0.15, so I'll select that, and it can't do that either. So if we go a little bit smaller, 0.14, that will work, but then it leaves this step, which is still gonna be a problem, is still gonna hang up on the sand. It's not very big, but it's still there. And as we map this across all of the other letters, especially the ones with more complex geometry, all kinds of bad things start to happen. So that approach just did not work. The approach that I found that actually does sort of work is to just do the chamfer around the top of the letters and then come back and just delete these outer faces. So I can just click right here and hit the delete key. Whoop, and the whole thing goes away. So it turns out you have to be very careful about the order in which you do this. So I can select those faces, hit delete, and it goes away again. And so there, it is possible to do this, where if you delete all of these in the right order, there, I deleted that one, then come in here, delete this one, then here, and delete that one, and we can work our way around this letter and we can gradually get the chamfer that we want. The problem is this falls apart very quickly. You saw I had to try several different orders there in order to get this to work properly, and that is what happens. It just ends up being a mess, and you'll, you'll get partway through this, and then you'll delete one more face, the whole thing goes away, and you have to undo that and try them in a different order. And worse, Sometimes when you do that, the whole letter disappears, but sometimes Fusion just crashes, or sometimes Fusion takes two or three minutes to compute before it comes back, and it ends up just being a real mess. And you can get 90% of the way through this and then have one letter or one symbol that's problematic, and the whole thing falls apart. And you can see that I did eventually get through this. Let me undo what I just did here. But you can see down here in the timeline, I've got this long chain of all these face delete operations. And I can you know, scroll through a bunch of these. Now we'll wait, and we'll wait while it computes. 8%, 9%, 10%. And the thing is, every time you add one new delete face, it takes a while and it has to recompute all of this, and sometimes it crashes, and then you have to start all over. I won't make you wait for this, I'll fast forward through it. Okay, that was about 45 seconds of computing, and you can see we're not done yet. We still have to go all the way to the end, and there are a bunch more of these faces. That was about half of them. And keep in mind that while you're editing, you have to keep waiting for that. Every time you add a couple of new faces, and you can't just do a whole bunch of them because all the letters disappear. You have to do everything in exactly the right order to satisfy the compute. So this is really not a viable option. However, I finally figured out what causes this, and the problem at its base is fonts. I was working on another project where I needed to extrude some, uh, some text with taper, and let me show you what I was doing. So I'll create a sketch here, and I'll pick a plane, doesn't matter, grab the text tool, and put in some text with a nice script font. And in this case, this is what I needed. I needed misses to be embossed or, or extruded. So we'll grab that and then we'll right click on this and say explode text just so that you can see the edges of what's going on here. 
and you can already see some problems with this font. The joints where the letters come together, this is supposed to be a nice flowing script, but it actually isn't. It's two pieces, and they don't actually fit together properly. So if you take these and you extrude them, there are going to be little discontinuities in these lines. That's not a huge deal, but it gets worse. Like if you take a look in here, like look at this nice curve at the top of the center of the M. Those are nice. They come down to some nice, sharp, clean points at the bottom of these. Now watch what happens if I make this bold. So undo that. We'll change this to bold. Okay, that looks fine. It's bold, but when we explode the text, all kinds of weird things have happened. These nice curved internal edges here now have these funny little overlaps and little gaps that are cut off. The one over here is even worse. And I think there's actually one at the bottom here, but it's very, very small, and that's about as far as I can zoom in before Fusion clips and I can't see it anymore. So in this case, it's just doing a really dumb processing of the letter. It's just taking the outline and it's expanding it. It's not a separate font or using a separate designed font. And so you get all of these weird little inconsistencies. So if I finish the sketch here, hit E for extrude, extrude one millimeter, we get something that looks good from far, but when you get up close, it's a mess. There are all these little hollows in it, and there's actually a zero point here in the geometry. That's touching, but there's zero overlap. So if I just say, okay, I want to chamfer this, and just say modify chamfer, select that top surface, and do even something tiny, like a 0.1 millimeter, it, it can't compute it. And I think this is actually what was causing the problems with my logo. The font is simpler, but if you look very closely at it, there are all kinds of little places where the lines don't quite come together right, or they overlap slightly, or there are places where you would expect a nice smooth curve, but the segments don't actually come together with a tangent. There's something else going on. So what I did is I went back and I redesigned my logo. The sketch that I have here is actually an SVG that I imported, and this was an export that came out of Adobe Illustrator. So I just used Adobe Illustrator, and I put this together, and I overlapped the 4 with the H, and I messed around with the italic angle until I got exactly what I wanted and got this sort of stylized H and 4 and put this together and created my logo, just exported an SVG, and that's what I've been using in Fusion. So what I did is I came back and in another project, I imported this logo and then I used it as a guide and I actually designed my logo to sit on top of that. So if I turn these both on, you can see they don't match exactly. And what I've done is I've actually drawn the logo just following the original as a guide. And then I came back through and put all the constraints. So there, it's actually dimensioned. So all the space is even and all the curves are the same size. It doesn't match the original font exactly, but everything comes tangent. Like this line doesn't come tangent on the original. It does on my new sketch. So now we're back to the same point we were before. I have the text extruded off of the surface and we just need to chamfer it. But unlike before, the geometry here is clean and it doesn't have little artifacts that came from the font. So now I can just use a single chamfer operation and I've just selected the top and I've selected all of the outside edges, put in 15 thou, so it's taken 15 thou from the top and 15 thou from the bottom. And this came out clean on the first try with no drama whatsoever. So it turns out that's really all that I've been fighting for the last year is just font geometry and I didn't even realize it. Now I've known for a long time that dealing with fonts in Fusion is very painful. And while it has gotten a lot better over the years, I think it really depends on the font you're using because often the fonts are going to have little tiny imperfections that cause problems with some of this further processing, like trying to put chamfers and fillets on things. So now you know, if you're having problems with fonts, try actually just copying the outlines that you need in a real sketch with real geometry constraints. Your Fusion Computation Engine will thank you. This casting is all white and shiny because it's been painted with enamel paint, but it started out looking like this. This is just a typical resin print with a normal fast modeling resin. 
This resin is generally designed for, you know, aesthetic models or tabletop minis or any kind of small parts that are not going to be mechanically functional. They're just meant to, you know, look at and handle. They're not meant to be durable. So this material is pretty soft. This scratches easily. You can, uh, it abrades, you can scrape away material. You can sand this very, very readily. And in fact, I have sanded this pattern down quite a bit. You can kind of still see some of the evidence of sort of stippling on this surface. And that's because that's where all the support material was to hang this from the print bed. So the print bed's here and there's a bunch of support material that comes down and attaches. And every place where that attaches to the model, it leaves a little dimple. And so that's part of the reason why I coated it with enamel paint. And part of that is just for durability. This is really slick. This is kind of a matte surface and it's soft enough that I thought the sand from the sand casting process would wear this away really quickly. And then the sand would start to stick to it or you know the details would become indistinct if it was used a lot. So that's why I coated it with enamel paint. And that worked pretty well, but I think this pattern was only used maybe four times, and you can see that the paint is already definitely wearing off. And I don't know how long something like this would really last. I don't know how, how big a deal it is, but this particular surface that has the most wear, that's because that goes down on the, on the wood uh, in the bottom of the flask when you actually cast this up, and I'm, I'm sure um, I'm, I'm getting all of the words wrong. I know the words cope and drag and flask, but I, I, I'm certainly not an expert in casting. I'll leave that to Clark. But um, this pattern isn't wearing as well as I would like. If we're going to use these for a long production run, I would need to make a bunch of these, I think. So I've been playing around with some different materials trying to find a better process for making these. The first thing I tried was just printing this in PLA. This was printed on the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon, and this is printed with very, very fine layer lines, 0.8 millimeters specifically, because I wanted to see just how accurately a, a, an FDM printer could reproduce these curves, how smooth it could get, and just see if we could potentially get to a place where we could make some really, really fast, essentially disposable PLA models. The cost of these would be extremely low. This is actually the Bamboo Lab PLA Tough material, and I just wanted to try it just to see how accurately I could make the casting and how smooth I could get the surfaces. And the answer is, it's pretty good. There were still layer lines that were in here. You really couldn't see them, but you could feel them, and a fingernail across them could feel them. So I did some sanding just to see how much work it would take to smooth that out because I didn't want the sand grains to catch on it. And, you know, I think the result is pretty good. I think this would be totally serviceable as is. However, I think I still would want to paint this. And my goal here is to try to come up with something that I wouldn't have to paint because the painting process is messy, takes time, you have to wait for the paint to dry, it takes a surprising amount of time for this enamel to set up. So if I were going to be making a bunch of these, it would be a lot of labor and I just don't want to deal with that. I did incidentally also try printing one vertically with this surface down on the print bed with the same 0.8 millimeter layers thinking well then the layer lines would be oriented in this direction and that would make it pull more smoothly from the sand, so maybe no sanding would be necessary. But the reality of that is that with this shape, if this is on the bed, then this is all overhang, and while it printed pretty well, it really did need to be sanded in order to be smooth and, and give a good surface for the pattern. So this absolutely would work, and I think I like the resin better if I'm gonna be painting it anyway, just because the surface ends up so much smoother. But um, I think either of these would work if I were going to paint it. But I have been playing around recently with a couple of exotic resins. These are from Soraya Tech. This is their Fast Mecca, and this is their Blue Nylon Mecca. And what these are, this is, a, this is kind of a fast modeling resin, and this is more of a nylon-like resin that's a little bit more flexible, but is super tough, really durable and has much higher tensile strength. But both of these are mixed with some kind of a filler. And so they end up being white. 
and they end up being very, very hard and very, very durable and very abrasion resistant. And I have had some great success making gears with these. And I have seen other people who have made even like worm gear trains with this material and it just does not wear. You print these same gears in this kind of just a modeling resin and you just spin them around a few times and they just immediately start wearing, raising white dust and just all kinds of gunk and you can see the surfaces galling and wearing away. With this stuff, I have seen none of that. These things are hard, they're shiny, they're smooth and uh, I've been really impressed. This particular gear set is a little bit too tight the, the white particles do tend to spread the light from an MSLA printer and cause it to over cure and cause the boundaries to grow. So you have to compensate for that in the slicer, which I didn't do when I printed this particular gear set. But I have been really, really impressed with just how hard and just how slick and how smooth these surfaces are. So I thought this might make a really great material for a casting pattern because I would expect it to stand up to the sand really well. I would expect it to be nice and smooth and slick. So let's, let's print a pattern or two with these resins and just see how they turn out. Welcome to my bathroom. This is where I have my resin printing set up. It's a, it's a pretty good match because there's a vent fan that can help to deal with the fumes. We've got hard surfaces that are easy to wipe up. We've got a sink for hand washing. It's a, it's a good situation if you can swing it, if your family will allow you to do it. I've got a spare bathroom because my kids have left home, so this is a convenient solution for me. We get this print into the wash. This is 99% isopropyl alcohol, and you can see I've used it many times. It's quite cloudy. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff already in there from previous prints. You can see a lot of that's gray modeling resin. It won't really matter here. We're just trying to get the bulk of this resin off, and it is thick. This stuff is difficult to rinse off, so it takes quite a bit of agitation. You can also see that the model is hollow, and I left little holes in it. If I didn't, it would be full of liquid resin, and we definitely don't want that, and we definitely don't want to print something this size solid. So I've left two holes at the top and two holes at the bottom so that it will fill with IPA while it's being washed, and then I can lift it up and let that drain out. not perfect but it's the best solution that I've found. Try not to splash this all over everything. You can see that IPA that's running out after two or three rinses is starting to get a little bit more clear. You're never going to get it all out. That's just kind of the nature of it. And this stuff is thick and sticky enough. I'm using a spatula here to try to scrape what I can or just get it dislodged off of the top of the build plate. This hung on the build plate overnight after the print finished, so it kind of, it doesn't really dry, but it kind of sets in. So we'll get that completely drained out. I'll run this down to the garage. You can see I also printed little wedge-shaped plugs. Those will go in the holes later to seal it up. Now to deal with the debris that's in my rinse, I'll just grab a bottle here of 99% IPA and actually rinse down the entire outside. You can do multiple baths. That's really the way to go on this if you've got the space. I really don't in here and I do this infrequently enough that just keeping a spray bottle full of IPA works for me and it also tends to replenish the part that I lose to evaporation or lose to the models when I clean them. Now I'll run this down to the garage and blow it off with compressed air and I'll be back in a moment. In addition to blowing it off, I also took the opportunity to take those tapered plugs and wedge them in the holes. No need for glue or anything. When this cures, they'll set up and they'll be there. They'll be there permanently. Now I do find that blowing it off with compressed air before curing it is a good idea. If there are any little wet spots or wet fingerprints in the surface with the IPA, when you cure it, those will show up in the surface finish. And there's really not much you can do about it. So getting everything blown off nice and dry first is a good plan. Now this curing station has LEDs on the posts and it also has a row of LEDs that are underneath the print, but I am still going to cure this on both sides. I found that the underside doesn't get cured as well as I would like. And this particular resin takes quite a bit of curing. 
And while that's running, I'll just take advantage of the time and do a little bit of cleanup. There's really not much resin left on this plate, but the, the filler material kind of sticks to it. So we'll just flip that upside down, run it another 10 minutes the other side up, and that should leave it completely cured or at least completely cured enough. And there they are. These are the two different resins. This one is printed in the blue mecca. I labeled this as a 5 16 inch threaded hole that goes through the center of mass for extracting this from the sand. And I just went ahead and wrote that on there just so that, you know, at the foundry there'll be no confusion and, and uh, I wrote it on there. I have to say this material is just amazing. I did end up sanding it just because there is a little bit of texture, like you could feel the layer lines on these very gradual slope surfaces. These surfaces all have draft of a couple of degrees and I just wanted to make sure that those would extract from the mold. I was a little bit surprised at how well the blue mecha sanded. I expected since this stuff is so uh, abrasion resistant that I would have trouble sanding it, but I really didn't. And this is the one that I just finished printing. This is printed in the Fast Mecca and I've done no post-processing on this at all. I printed it with this edge on the plate and so because of the way this stuff, uh, you have a very, very long exposure on the first layer, there's a little ridge here that we can feel. We'll want to sand that off. And then I plugged these holes. There are little plugs in them and those are just, you know, tapered parts that I printed and I stuck them in after the part was washed, after it was washed out and I blew out the interior just using these little holes with compressed air to get out as much of the alcohol as I could and then just press those in prior to curing. And then when I cured them, they just fused to the other material and they are stuck. So let's see what it takes to get this cleaned up. And again, this is the fast mecha. So this is the modeling resin with the, with the filler as opposed to the, the nylon-like tough resin. Now the easiest way to get these off is just with a Japanese style flush saw. This is not a real Japanese one. This is just a, my local hardware store one. But these kinds of woodworking tools tend to work really well for post-processing plastic like this. And that does cut and that's nice and flush. We'll sand it anyway. Now I do like to go nice and slow when cutting these off because I have had situations where I kind of twist the saw a little bit or put a little bit too much force on it and the peg actually snaps off instead of cutting cleanly and then, they, then you get a little crater there that you have to fill or you know reprint or ignore. Now I am noticing that this material is much, much harder to cut than the nylon-like uh, material. It's just more rigid and this stuff's set up a lot harder. Okay. Let's see how it sands. Just got some 320 grit automotive wet dry sandpaper. Don't think I'm gonna need to go any coarser than that. And I can kind of feel the layer lines. You can hear them here. Now this particular side is just gonna pull straight away, so I don't think it really matters, but it's a good way to test and see how it sands. Well, that sands, it's a lot harder to sand than the blue was. The blue mecha sanded much easier. This is much harder and more abrasion resistant, but it does sand down nicely and we get a nice smooth surface. See if we can take the, the kind of elephant foot ridge off of the edge that was against the plate. Oh yeah, that's no problem at all. That's pretty nice. One thing I am noticing is the sandpaper is not loading up. After, after doing the, the blue mecha one, the nylon-like one, the sheet of sandpaper I was using was just completely white and caked up and had basically stopped cutting. So this material sands 
it, it's harder to sand. The material doesn't come off as quickly, but it does leave just a beautiful fine surface finish and it doesn't clog the paper. So that's pretty nice. I will go over this again with some 600 just to get it as smooth as I can. I don't think there was much point to that, but the last thing I want to do is just make sure these threads are nice and clean. These were actually printed and modeled 5 16 18, and I've got a 5 16 18 bottoming tap, and I'll just run that in. They should be pretty close, but it's never perfect, especially because this material overgrows the boundaries just slightly. It's kind of an odd sensation because it just bottoms suddenly because it's a bottoming tap and it's a flat bottom 3D printed hole. So it's a strange sensation when you're running the tap in. Okay, let me clean up my mess and let's take a look at it. That's the finished product. I have to say I'm really, really impressed with how these turned out. I'm really liking this fast mecha resin. Uh, it's not cheap but if it produces a good solid pattern like this that will last for many, many castings, I think it's totally worth the expense of the resin and a little bit of effort cleaning up the print. And I, you know, I, I, can't, I can't complain about this at all. I don't know how to describe this surface. It almost feels soft, even though it's, it's really hard. A fingernail doesn't dig into it or scratch it. it. Doesn't really make any noise. It's kind of somewhere between a plastic and a ceramic kind of feel. But I think this is going to be a really durable pattern. I will send both of these over to Clark. And in fact, I'll probably go ahead and shoot some paint on the softer ones and send them just as backups so that he can play with them and see what he thinks. But I think these are going to be solid patterns that should last for many, many castings. If you are interested, especially if you're one of the people that contacted me asking if you could buy these, they are going to be available and they're going to be available through Windy Hill Foundry directly. So if you just contact Clark at Windy Hill and ask for one, he can give you pricing information and he can cast these on demand for you. I don't know exactly what that price is going to be and I don't really want to put that in a video anyway just because it's something that's going to change over time. But I will put contact information for Windy Hill Foundry down in the video description and in a pinned comment. So if you're interested in getting one of these, that information will be available. Thank you for watching.